So we sell around 1.5 million room nights uh, per, uh, per day. So if you do some extrapolations about how many users that, that are and how many events these users generate, um, and if you train, train models and you use historical data, you might want to go one year back or even two years, that's a lot of data. Uh, so it's quite, quite a challenge to, to uh, optimize this. And if you have 200 data scientists uh, that all are doing similar things, uh, maybe repeat each other's work, uh, and you have limited resources, we have our own uh, yarn set up, then uh, yeah, it's quite of a challenge to make sure this uh, scales uh, well. Uh, so yeah, we've, we try to optimize those processes. Uh, we also think that it's with a lot of data, you, you can build decent models with really simple algorithms, logistic regressions, random forest, uh, GBM. With H2O, it's really simple to, to build these, uh, these models um, if you provided decent features, and uh, uh, then you can produce some de decent stuff quite easily. So um, we formulated some requirements for ML. It doesn't sound that, that hard uh, or that complicated to some of this list. It should scale well. It should be easy to use, uh, statistically sound, fast, reliable, and easily productionizable. Especially the last one, is, uh, uh, I relate to that one quite, quite well because uh, when I first started, uh, I created the model with R and it took quite some time to, to, uh, you know, to come up with that and then I wanted to go to production and then you have to translate it into Perl and MySQL and cron jobs and I wasn't comfortable with any of this. Uh, so I had to work with all kinds of developers, it took a lot of time and a lot of errors occurred and, and yeah, these kinds of examples we really don't want uh, anymore. So the, it should be easy, as easy as possible. Data scientists should go to production as soon as possible. So the first thing we tried was uh, Spark, MLlib, two years ago. Uh, Spark is really awesome at, at data munching. Uh, yeah, we still use it the f uh, for that main, uh, main purpose. And we also assumed that uh, Spark would also shine with the ML uh, components. That wasn't really the case. It was, uh, quite unstable, it was also quite slow. Um, not many functionalities for the people that were using Python and also quite hard to productionize and the predictions were, were also not that fast. So we, we continued to search for something better. Then we met the uh, H2O guys at Strata um, and we tried it out. It was really uh, fast, super easy to use, the skills really good. Um, the mojos or the pojos back then were, were really awesome. So that was, were good sell, uh, sales for us. So we, we continued working with that. But as soon as we tried to use it with more people at once uh, during peak hours uh, during the week, uh, we, we couldn't really rely on, on uh, uh, stable sessions. So we use yarn. Uh, who's familiar with yarn? And, uh, okay, so basically we have limited resources. We have thousands of machines with a lot of cores. But we also have a lot of people that use a lot of cores at the same time. So you need to distinguish or uh, uh, balance who gets what. Um, and Yarn also takes away resources when someone else might need it. And that's when an HO breaks. So uh, we uh, couldn't get that to work. So we teamed up with uh, uh, Kuba, Michal. Uh, we developed the external cluster mode. Uh, Kuba, you're sitting there, I think. Let's Raise your hand and <laughs> thank you for helping us out. It was really uh, awesome stuff that you built. And uh, Luca will explain that a bit more, what we did. Yeah. So actually, let's deep um, look a bit more why we like sparkling water booking. Um, so as we said, for us, this represents kind of uh, taking the best of two worlds. We really like the data matching ability and possibility with Spark to have this distributing computation so that we can create data frames with the meaningful feature that we want to use for training. But we didn't really like the algorithms from SparkML. And instead, we quite like what H2O provides us. And the integration between these two pieces of software is quite smooth now. And that is really something that can boost our workflows and help us out to develop better models. Uh, so let's see how this usually looks like. Um, so as you can see on the left, we have data sources. sources. So on our front end, we recall and we collect a lot of information about what our user look. So what kind of searches do you do on the website? What kind of hotels they look at? What kind of reviews they read? Um, and all of this data is saved into a separate pipeline that we have for events and eventually end up into our data warehousing system. We have then workflows on top that clean up this data and generates meaningful tables that people can use for training of models. So the typical workflow now is that people will start doing the data matching with Spark. They will come up with a data frame with all the features that are required. And then they can ship over to H2O and continue over there. Um, 
doing the model building, choosing across different algorithms. It's also very convenient because Alpha Spark per se, it's written in Scala and H2O in Java. They both provide uh, nice wrappers in R and Python, which are usually the languages that data scientists know and prefer to work with. So that's pretty convenient. And then once that you actually have your model, it's pretty easy to export it into this Mojo format, for example, which is just binary code that you can easily embed into other services, and it allows quick predictions. So to complete a bit on what we saw in the previous image, what we do now is like we have exported the graph. Yeah. We have exported the, the model over here into a binary, and we want to deploy it in production. We'll go through how we actually deploy the models later on in the talk. Uh, but now what is also important is that on the front end, so on all of these pages that I was mentioning before, we are also collecting small streams of relevant information that we can reuse then with technologies like Spark Streaming to recompute the very same features that we use offline, online. And with that, we can feed the model and do in prediction real time during the session. So we means, that means that we can personalize the experience of the user visiting the website just real time in the same session, which is key. So about our collaboration with H2O, when we started one year ago, roughly, one year, one year and a half ago, um, what we saw is that H2O come with this mode, which is called the internal backend, um, where the backend here, it just means where is the H2O cluster sitting. And in this mode, what you see is that every Spark executor will spin up its own JVM, of course, and inside of that will spin up an H2O uh, node. And all these nodes then compose the cluster. This is good in the sense that uh, it's really easy to set up. It's quick to move data between the Spark context and the H2O context, because you don't really have to move anything. Uh, but at the same time, it was what Ben was mentioning before as a problem. If the number of workers in Spark change for any reason, decrease or increase, the H2O cloud fails and just, yeah, it explodes. <laughs> so that's not really useful for our use case, given that we have a very busy cluster where there are things enabled like preemption, which means that if resources are not available anymore, some of your workers may just get killed, and then you lose all of your session. Um, so together with H2O, we move to this model instead, which is the external backend. And the change here is that the workers and the cloud of H2O is completely separated. It's not with the Spark workers. So in our setup, for example, we created a dedicated queue in Yard, a queue which is not preemptible and with static resources. So people can start doing the data munching in their personal queue or team queue, and the H2 cluster lives in this separate queue. This has, has a drawback that now we need to ship data between the two contexts, but it allows to actually use this thing at scale for us, which was key. And if you want to dig a bit more into sparkling water, I know Kuba has a session today at 1 and on, so feel free to join it. To summarize, we gave some examples of how we use machine learning, the machine translations uh, topic, web marketing, uh, ranking hotels, and uh, email marketing. Um, that it's quite challenging to find something that's easy to use for data scientists and to deploy it automatically or autonomously in production uh, without de relying on developers. Um, so with H2O and Sparkling Water, we have a good fit for that and uh, Spark feature map, streaming feature mappers. Uh, Antonio is one of the colleagues here that gives trainings on H2O, how we use it. Um, so that's working uh, quite well for us. And for us, I just wanted to share just two really quick use cases, and I'll talk more about you know, what's on here compared to what's on the slides, but one of our use cases is that we have uh, hospitals contract with us to, uh, they just as, as you know, we mentioned earlier, everyone has a denied claim or something that just drives you nuts of why is this denied, why didn't I get paid? Um, we have a team at Change Healthcare that works uh, denied claims on behalf of hospitals. And the, the amount of claims that they receive from hospitals, sometimes it might be their entire inventory of, of claims. And so if you can just imagine trying to wrap your mind around you know, sorting through a thousand claims, uh, and claims have you know, ICD-10 codes and procedure codes and payment amounts and all these different things, how do you actually, uh, if you, know, if you were given the task of here's a thousand claims, which ones uh, should we work, because we only have so many resources, uh, work being you know, uh, file an appeal on behalf of the hospital systems, uh, versus which ones are just you know, uh, dead money, basically. Um, our old flow was to 
we would have individuals that would, you know, analysts that would go through and sort through thousands and hundreds of thousands of claims to try to identify what to work. Um, we came in, uh, we, we used H2O. Uh, we have a handful of models to help us say which, which claims should we work on, which one shouldn't we. Uh, and, and if they are incorrect, how much, what's the value in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the total potential? And this business unit, uh, you know, it wasn't a 5% increase in, in the, the overall business. It was a much greater impact to their uh, top and bottom line in terms of actually working on behalf of hospitals to get uh, to work denied claims that, that otherwise they kind of would have just, you know, left drift off into the ether. So, uh, and I just real quick, you know, at the bottom, we just, it's a really simple concept that we kind of build out. It's like score a set of claims, uh, you know, procedure code, diagnosis code, payments, clients, just an example. Uh, the probability that it's a, you know, that there's some sort of error. All right, let's work that one. Um, we have another use case that I wanted to share. We've got, a, at this point, we probably have uh, 10 or 15, uh, you know, actual production jobs that are in, in some stage between proof of concept and, and full-blown production. Um, but, but we have, uh, it's kind of, this is kind of like an email targeting click-through campaign. Uh, you have, you basically want to, you're working for, on behalf of a self-pay insurer, uh, which would be somebody, you know, some large corporation, let's say they've got 15,000 employees, and uh, you get those emails where it's like, hey, it's time for your flu shot. <laughs> um, that's, so that's, that's a good, tar you know, that's a targeted, you know, advertising kind of effect of, uh, you know, reminding people to get their flu shots. But how much further can we take that? Can we say, you know, who's likely to have a knee replacement in the next six or nine months, or who's likely to have a hip replacement in the next six or nine months? And it's, whenever you're talking about hundreds of thousands of, or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of patients, we just can't wrap our minds around what that actually needs to look like. And further, we can't, it's hard to use data to drive your decisioning of what, how to make these choices of, of who to target and who not to. And so this particular use case of predicting procedures, and you know, let's say it's a knee replacement as an example, uh, we pair this with another division within our company that tr attempts to go through and uh, create uh, targeted uh, messaging and content to say, uh, not just for reducing cost, this isn't so much like a high deductible health plan, you know, let's try to save as much money as we can. It's actually to try to get the best quality of care because uh, sometimes, you know, getting somebody to a, a knee replacement uh, you know, overseas or something for $5,000 might not be the best uh, course of care if you can, uh, you want to have somebody that's going to have low readmission rates and, and not, uh, you know, less likely to have infection and those types of things. So this, this particular project that, that we developed, uh, and this is, this, is a th this is a production artifact that we have, uh, it's able to predict out who, you know, create a, a cluster of, of members who are likely to have these types of uh, procedures moving forward. Um, so, so those are kind of just two high-level use cases of, of, how we do, of what we did. And I wanted to share a little bit about how we do it because we, we think for healthcare that we've established, uh, f for healthcare in the cloud, um, it's, well, healthcare in the cloud is kind of an oxymoron to, to some de degree. But for us, we're really proud of the, the you know, actual tool chain and tool set that we have. So that's kind of our workflow in terms of how we're, uh, our team models. But the, the one of the things that, that is essentially, that is really cool for us is our, how we handle our batch processing. Um, we, the, the use case that I described earlier about um, how we handle uh, our, the denials, the denied workflow. We, we run that model, we retrain that model and, and run it uh, kind of on a weekly basis uh, on average, and we, f we follow this kind of framework, and it only runs for one hour a week. And so in the old school data center mentality, uh, you, would, you would buy some server or have some sar server hardware, uh, pay quite a few thousand dollars to be able to host and run this model. For us, one hour a week on Amazon uh, is, I don't, I don't know the math offhand, but less than $200 maybe. Uh, so to be able to go into a, uh, you know, and this is, a, this is one of the core concepts of the data lake, to be able to go into a, a executive meeting and say, well, 
and they, and you know, project planning, it's how, what's the architecture cost going to be? And it's like, well, it's, it's going to be less than $500, uh, just, just the cost to, to run EMRs for an hour a week. Um, this, is, this is what we get to say. And the way we do it, uh, you know, basically, we have a file that's dropped within our process. Uh, that triggers a Lambda function. I don't know if the laser, I don't think the laser works very well. Uh, it triggers a Lambda function. The Lambda function will spin up a uh, H2O, or H2O and Spark uh, on EMR uh, using the AWS uh, architecture. And then basically you train and score a model right there, return the results back, that's that bottom left corner, uh, back to the data lake, and we'll also alert the supporting application that, hey, your file's done, and then they go in and pick it up. So the whole end-to-end -end piece, it's, it's a, this, is our, this is basically our method for how we want to um, handle our integration of our data lake across many different, um, many different silos within our business, uh, being a kind of a centralized data science team. So the, the main flow is that it doesn't matter if it's on some you know, on-premise Oracle database or uh, Microsoft SQL Server or whatever it might be, we can have a supporting application get our data into our data lake. We can do our processing on it and return the results back. We don't need to do a whole lot of specialized integration back into production workflows. Um, so for us, and this isn't, this isn't anything special to change healthcare. This is a very common, you know, just how do you handle batch processing with EMRs, uh, with, with, you know, on-demand architecture in essence. And so that, that brings us to, to what's next. And I, I wanted to just share just a really quick story um, that, that we're successful with with H2O uh, kind of over the past week. If you, if you think about what, uh, you think about the technology for text. So we're starting to get into, we have a lot of text across our company uh, in terms of medical records and, uh, you know, appeal notes and a whole different, a whole slew of things around text. Uh, even whenever you get an eligibility, it's just one big field of text coming back to you. And so if one of the things in the industry of, of healthcare has been a concept called computer-assisted coding. And if you don't know what computer-assisted coding is, it's just trying to you know, auto-code some you know, block of text to identify that you know, these sentence or, sentence or sentences make up a diagnosis of pneumonia, let's just say as an example. And the, the really... Uh, interesting, we did an experiment where computer-assisted coding has been around for 10 or 15 years, and a lot of the industry leaders have kind of been in a, in a realm of, uh, you know, selling over, over that, that time frame, uh, usually under kind of the nomer of uh, NLP and those types of things. And so what we did was we took, you know, we know that Word to VEC and deep learning couldn't have been any sooner than 2015, because Word to VEC only came out in, uh, you know, 2014. Let's just say, uh, in terms of like being able to actually productionalize it. Um, before that, you know, we were looking at TF, IDF, and uh, you know, GLMs to to build out our what our models looked like um, with with text specifically. And so what we did was we kind of took the technology from you know 2007, let's say, to 2017, and just applied it across. And what so what in terms of what other people are doing with coding, how far can you get with the existing technologies and then how far does it look today? And, and really, we're just talking about 2016 and 2017 uh, because Word to VEC was one thing and then applying it to deep learning was a whole other uh, component. And I'm not even necessarily talking about TensorFlow. I'm talking about the deep learning architectures within H2O and the Word to VEC uh, incorporated in H2O. Using that, <laughs> what what you can code automatically using text and a diagnosis code or procedure code, uh, you're basically two or three times better using Word to VEC and deep learning. And this was our, this was our experiment that we ran out and we, could, we plan to continue refining it. But for us, it really represents, and this was, this was done with H2O. And we're, we're basically, for us, we're going to double down on, on using H2O for our, our text-based uh, applications as well as our claim-based applications. Um, and, and for uh, additionally, we, are, we do have a lot of models that have been developed out in TensorFlow. Um, we're excited to see what, you know, the vision with H2O goes with that. 
and uh, you know, in terms of we don't want to be, you know, we last last week we announced a uh, partnership with Google. Uh, we don't as a as a you know change healthcare being integrated with um, Amazon. We want to have diversity across our portfolio of our technology and our stack. Um, and we definitely, you know, as as we go through, we definitely want to continue. Uh, exploring our options with EHR and, and medical records. Um, driverless AI for us represents probably the next big step uh, in terms of what our, our strategy is. Our, our data scientists aren't, they're not proud of, you know, the, the specific model that was developed or, uh, you know, checking in some code with their name on, I developed this particular model. It's much more so a, a matter of, uh, you know, the quality of things that we're building and the speed at which we're building those. And for us, the, the more com the components that are, that are quality and, and have high impact is what drives us. So it's, there isn't so much a pride of, oh, I want to do feature engineering and I want this to look like, you know, I want to be the guy that codes all this stuff. Uh, using driverless AI and auto ML and those types of tools definitely represents the next step for us. We used H2O for modeling uh, mobile transactions, uh, both for forecasting and, and anomaly detection. Uh, Capital One's mobile banking app is, is one of our largest platforms. Um, just to give you some uh, additional context here in the, in the 25 or so, 30 minutes that we're going to be on stage, we would expect there to be about 150,000 customers that log into this platform. So if you think about it, that's about 5,000 or so every minute. And if something breaks, if there's just a one minute outage, you know, you could fill this entire, I think it's about 400 some odd seats here, you could fill this entire auditorium 12 times over in that very brief period of time. So, you know, the clock's ticking whenever you've got an outage, so it's imperative that you recognize that you identify the issue and you take action. So, basically we had two kind of generalized scenarios. This is, this is getting at the problem that we um, had identified. You know, in the monitoring space, usually you can trigger off of a, uh, a failure rate. You know, that's pretty straightforward, simple math. Failures over, over total opportunities. Uh, pretty easy to set a threshold for. Easy to detect, measure, and alert on. Uh, but the, the problem that we were looking at and we wanted to investigate further is what you see on the right side of the screen here where you know, if there's, if there's an absence of volume, how do, you, how do you effectively alert on that? How do you inform teams that there's, a, that there's missing volume or there's higher than expected volume? In this example, you can see a br brief drop, but after that, did it continue to go down but was supposed to level out? Was it supposed to go up? Is it completely normal? It's kind of hard to tell. And therein lies the problem. You, it's, it's hard to detect, measure, and alert on. If you go back for one second, just kind of keep that right image in your mind for a bit. We're going to revisit it at the end. Um, but just try to think, is this an anomaly? Is it not? If it is, when did it start? When did it end? Um, and those are kind of the struggles that we, that we face in terms of the, the low volume anomaly. Yep. Thank you. Yes, definitely remember this. We're going to come back to this image that you see on the right-hand side there. So you think, well, why not just set volume alerts? <clears throat> um, well, it actually becomes quite challenging quite quickly. You've got volumes that change over time, and obviously you have uh, factors like time of day, hour minute, day of week, uh, a number of other seasonal type uh, factors. And you know, we specifically were looking to uh, deliver something that could scale, uh, that we could build off of, and that didn't require a whole lot of coding, development, and oversight to manage. So you know, you do the math, and we've got. Uh, several hundred customer events that we were looking to uh, to be able to forecast and detect volume anomalies on, you do the math and you very quickly realize, well, you've got a lot of thresholds to maintain. And then you, th you throw in organic growth and um, other changes, which is way too much to keep up with. And, you know, this is the perfect uh, situation for you, to for you to leverage machine learning because it's really hard to code for and it really just doesn't scale very well. <clears throat> so we, we took the approach of, we've got, we've got this challenge, came up with the business case. Uh, we fought, defined the data that we wanted and needed to use. Uh, obviously, there was some, some wrangling and cleaning up that had been done and 
uh, was, was in need of being uh, done. We went through the modeling process. We developed a platform. We visualized, alert, uh, visualized and set alerts and ultimately piloted it. So there was a couple of things that we needed to attend, be, you know, be very attentive to. We needed to make sure that we were following any, any corporate governance requirements. Um, we, used, we wanted to use available data science and machine learning resources, hence the reason that we partnered with a couple of key players. Uh, we wanted to leverage platform engineering and op open source technology. And um, we wanted, again, to ensure that it was, the solution was usable and scalable. Thank you. So once we determined we wanted to use a machine learning approach to this, um, we started using sparkling water. Um, mainly for, one, we wanted to be able to prototype. So we knew, you know, we had a data set we hadn't seen before. As Donald mentioned, his team was kind of the business experts on this side of it. Um, so we wanted to approach it from a bunch of different angles. And sparkling water, and specifically the H2O piece of it, allowed us really rapid prototyping. Um, we started with a GLM. Um, we tried basically everything kind of in the suite of H2O models. Um, and we actually settled on a deep learning model to begin with. Um, and when we moved from our non-prod to our production environment, we realized that the, we had a smaller data set um, and GBM was more um, appropriate for that. And by being able to uh, run everything through REST API, which is how we ended up productionizing our software. Um, it's a pretty simple change just to put in the new parameters, change the reference from deep learning to GBM. Um, and now we're actually capable of, of switching between the two if we want or kind of incorporating any other model um, that we see fit as we develop and, and get more data and, and kind of learn more from the process. Um, so as everyone's you know, all aware, um, H2O is great in terms of, you know, it's in-memory processing. So for us, um, we tried, we're approaching it by doing a cloud-based solution, um, and we wanted to have that speed with in-memory. Um, and we have a bunch of Python experts on our team. Um, so we wanted to build out using Python, um, using the Spark capabilities in Scala to unify our pipeline um, that we were coding out. And it, it just was seamless by using Sparkling Water um, and the REST API approach. Um, and then in terms of actually testing the models, um, being able to use the grid search um, for optimizing hyperparameters, it's just a really big time saver. Um, for, you know, for me, as I was kind of going into it and trying to approach it, and we tested just kind of random things at first and tried to tune a bit. Um, and then I you know, kind of became aware of the grid search and it just really increased in, in moving towards that automating your modeling piece of it. Um, you know, even without kind of the driverless AI side of things, you can you know, optimize your modeling um, pretty well through that. So a lot of the benefits of sparkling water. Um, so the other issue that we kind of, we're approaching this by, it's it seemed like a traditional time series, um, something that a traditional time series would be perfect for. Um, we took it more from the GBM approach. A um, few different reasons. So traditional time series, if you're not going to adjust for it, is going to assume you know, stationary data. Um, and obviously, if we're looking at mobile application usage, you're going to see day of the week and week of the year. And holidays are going to play a factor and, and seasonality. Um, and we also have a lot of different gaps within our data or, for example, uh, incidents that might occur and cause downtime that we don't want to model for um, because we don't want to inc incorporate the bad data as we're trying to forecast a normal uh, pattern for the data. So by being able to incorporate this um, as a GBM instead, we can include um, external variables. So things like if you're trying to make a payment, um, you're, a lot of um, payments happen on the day that you get paid. So we'll see, for example, Fridays, um, large spikes in volume, um, which you can't normally do with a, a traditional Larima um, or you know, kind of one of those types of time series. Um, so we incorporated a bunch of different variables. Um, and they're very easy to include, to test exclude if we didn't want them or you know, add them as a weighted column, a lot of variability in there um, and very easy to, to customize it. Um, and as I mentioned, the other thing that we do is we incorporate an exclusion table um, that we just host on GitHub. Um, and it makes it very easy for anyone to go in and update um, with those anomalous periods that we don't want to um, include with our regular forecasting. So that kind of sets up what, um, what we are trying to accomplish in terms of the modeling side and then we get to actually productionizing it. So we needed a way to build out a pipeline for it that we could host, um, that we could scale and was repeatable. So um, as I mentioned, we were looking cloud-based, open source. So um, using 
a few of the different products from the AWS suite um, S3 for some storage of static data. Um, we run our anomaly detector on Amazon EC2. Um, and then everything else is run using time series database, which is InfluxDB um, that we're using now and visualizing through Grafana. Um, and we'll show you an example of that in a little bit um, in terms of what it actually looks like. Um, but this made it very easy to be able to scale out just by having this framework um, available to us. Um, and we can swap in different pieces. Um, you know, we can exclude the S3 if we don't find it useful. We can um, you know, kind of build out the EC2 capabilities. If we need more power to it, we can easily you know, add extra nodes to that cluster. Um, but so this is what we started with in terms of our uh, production pipeline. Thank you. So what does it look like? Um, just as a quick reminder, you know, our, our customer here was the, the, the teams that support, uh, that monitor for incidents across the enterprise. So there are visual, uh, contextual types of uh, elements that are kind of packaged in with all of this so that they can very quickly make sense of it. You know, there's, this is a group that is uh, as under the gun to quickly respond and resolve issues. So anything that you can do to reduce the, the cognitive load and make sure that they get very uh, crisp direction on what's going on is, is of value. So again, what does it look like? So what we've done is we've actually uh, as you saw on the previous slide, we take the actual volumes that are coming in real time and we overlay those with the forecast and confidence, ba uh, confidence bands so that anybody that's triaging or looking and exploring, they can very easily see. It's kind of, kind of hard to see here, I guess, but they can, get, they can see where the volume is. There's another slide coming up. It'll, be, it'll look a little bit better, but you can see where uh, volume is right now relative to what is normal. And um, across the bottom, you'll see uh, an anomaly band. So uh, what you'll again see here in a minute is when there is an anomaly, it's clearly marked. It's indicated with a timestamp. Uh, you can measure that. You can um, correlate it to the start time of incidents and other alarms. And what we didn't have in the, in the pipeline shot um, and kind of below this, if we extended this, we can um, we have alerting capabilities attached to it, so you can see as it lines up, um, and if you want to switch to the next slide, but any, any point where it goes red tells an anomalous yep. point, and then below that there's another area where it shows this is where it alerted, this is for how long it alerted, um, and sends that kind of extra information. So you, you've got the, the, uh, the view of it from here, but you're also getting messaging um, alerts. Yep. So um, we mentioned on one of the first slides to remember that slot, that panel that was on the right hand side, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, what what was normal, what was going on. This is the exact same data, but with our forecast. And you can clearly see that there was a drop in volume, and that uh, drop was maintained for a period of time before it picked back up. Now, uh, basically represents about 12 percent of the volume was missing, and in this case, fortunately, it wasn't actually customers that were not getting through and making it into the mobile app. Uh, this was actually a data issue, which you know was helpful here because we were able to identify it. Um, the 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 team that's actually the, the that generates this data in this slide wasn't even aware that there had been a drop in volume, just because they don't they don't have the same context, these visual cues, the anomaly detection. They don't have access to it yet, but we're working on that. So it, was, it uh, you know kind of proved that we were able to provide the necessary insights and, and, and um, highlight when there was a problem. But did it actually detect an incident? So this is one of the early examples where we actually did have a production issue. And um, again, you can see the spikes where volume at, lo uh, at login spiked. Uh, and you know, when, when assessing this after the fact, we were able to not only quantify that there was a 20,000 uh, that volume was 20,000 logins higher than expected. This uh, anomaly detection process and alerting solution actually beat other alarms by four minutes, which, again, when you're talking about 5,000 customers every minute, that's huge. That's, well, 20,000, <laughs> that wasn't planned. 20,000 customers, right? I mean, that's, 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 that's a, uh, a huge win for our customers and for the teams that are responding. 
And this was helpful in terms of being able to kind of sell this to the, the, our customer itself, mm -hmm. um, being able to build kind of a, a backlog essentially of, um, you know, here are different times where we were actually able to, to produce results that were useful. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, it looks nice, it's, it's great, but it's not useful unless the team that we're producing it for is actually gonna take it in and use it. So um, having measurable results that, um, that showed where we were beating their current metrics and showing how they could use this in addition to their um, current methods it was a good way to, to kind of lead it up and, and show them, you know, just kind of in that data transparency idea, just here's kind of everything that we have and this is a way to make it a little better. So I was here two years ago with some of my colleagues uh, for this same conference. And by that time, we only have a small group of people that is using H2. Then we got support with H2. We work with them. It's very present. Uh, we have more users. Then last, this year, we have an enterprise team production server in our cluster that uh, can, uh, everyone can create a cluster from uh, uh, Steam UI instead of go to a edge node or a client node in the cluster to create an edge to a cluster. Okay, then here I am. I'm at this conference and we have at least double uh, users in edge tool. Then hope, I believe that in future we are going to continuously grow uh, this uh, user groups uh, in Enna. So. What we did uh, with uh, H2O team is fantastic. We, we actually collaborated uh, together to, we actually contributed to, a, to a, one, of, one feature of uh, H2O and Steam to have a uh, secure impersonation in Kerberos uh, cluster. Then we, we discussed how we can improve Steam to make it more useful and more features. And training, we have in-person training and webinar going on all year long. So we, we, we usually have like maybe four in-person training and webinar is just a common, uh, it's a series. So it's continuously like, like recently we have like one every two weeks. So uh, from a data scientist uh, eyes, uh, this is how uh, our data scientists look at our analytics pipeline. We have our projects, they are all organized as a, with a business partner. The business partner will work with a data scientist and some data engineer and a statistician. And they identify a program, then we go, go look at uh, this work, no? Yeah, look at data. We look for data, then uh, we, we ingest them into our cluster, then we clean it, then you clean it, then uh, make it ready for the model. Then uh, at this point, sometimes we will generate some visualization reports for the business partners so that they have some idea about how the data look like. Then we continue this line to extract feature, generate feature, uh, build models, then we have some results. Then we either productionize it this model to make it real time for scoring, or uh, we, we just tap back to uh, business partner and ask for some feedbacks, and we keep improving the models, like add more features, create more features, like this kind of uh, regular data engineering job. Okay, so in my in engineering, uh, I look at it this way. So all our data is in Hive. I don't know if, uh, other companies doing the same, but uh, being, data being in Hive is uh, uh, a good way to, to handle. So we have Hive, we have Spark and Pick, and we, we do ETL with, with, with all the data, and we uh, put them back to Hive or HDFS. Then uh, I don't know if this is normal in all companies, but most of our data scientists, they use R. So, so they love H2O because uh, H2O for us is fantastic. Um, they create a cluster from RStudio or from Command actually. So, and they access RStudio from RStudio. Sorry, access H2O to cluster from RStudio. Then uh, once the model is done, then 
export it to a Java project or module, then production lies it in different ways. Depends on a business requirement. We could convert it into a REST API. We could create a hive EDF. We could just do a Java, simple Java application. So our use case, this is not uh, a complete list. I just did a quick survey from all the data scientists I know and uh, came up with some uh, use cases we have. We have, in production, uh, some emergency room revisit uh, model and customer experience model and overpayment model. And algorithms, mostly we are using GBM and uh, random forest. The data size uh, we can handle them before, before use H2O is uh, more than 50 times and even more, right? We, we know, uh, usually a Arch Studio server can handle maybe 200 or 300 megabytes of data, right? So when we use H2O, we can go up to 500 gig, like this kind of data set. This demo is uh, showing you how easy it is to have an Arch Studio project with uh, everything you need, H2 and H2 Steam. Uh, so, so this is a, a very sh simple shell script that uh, I just asked uh, uh, the owner of this laptop to run it once. Then uh, I think uh, I can still find the command, maybe. Yeah, this is a command that is, uh, he ran uh, before, just before this presentation. Then what this command do is, is generate an entire new uh, R Studio project for you so that you can use it. Uh, you, you can have HTML Steam with uh, whatever with the version you, you want. Right? So this is the project just generated by, by this program. And you can see the h 2 package is 3.1406. This is a, the package I installed uh, before I bundle the entire project. And it also has uh, HTO Steam already. So, let me see if I can get. Uh, it's a 0919. Uh, so this, this version might not be in CRAN at all. Or for some reason, your company doesn't want everyone to go to public internet. Right? This will happen for uh, uh, many companies. So then you have, in this RSTL project, you have everything ready. You have H2 and H2 Steam. Then you can install whatever package you need, like DeepPly or whatever, and go from there. So, uh, so if you uh, never used Packlet before, then uh, how, this is how you, you can find out. Go to this uh, Packlet, then uh, click Packlet option, you can see uh, this is a, a small checkbox. If you want to say create a new project, You can see there's a box here. Uh, use Packlet with this project. Uh, you can simply, it's, it comes with us today. Okay. So the last thing I want to show everyone is Steam. This is an enterprise Steam. Uh, it has uh, four, class, uh, four cluster and two are running, two are not. Then uh, when you need to create a cluster, you just say, Uh, I'll just create one node and two gig memory. This is the only version you can have. So administrator of this uh, website can, can upload whatever version you need. You just need to match your Hadoop version. Right? Uh, and launch a new cluster. It takes about maybe 10 or 15 seconds. Depends on how busy your cluster is. But uh, you don't need to go to command line anymore. 
right? And once this cluster is created, like I said before, um, cluster is launched. Uh, this is the cluster I created. So I can, the only way I can access flow for this cluster is click this link. Then you can open flow. Right? And nobody else, uh, even you, you copy this uh, entire URL, you are not going to open flow like me because I, I just created it from Steam, inside Steam, okay? In order to, so what I put in inside this project is I ask every user to include a password, right? Using a small package, I, small functions. A couple functions I wrote, and uh, then you can, uh, this is how you decrypt your password and without showing your password. And before that, you need to save your pa encrypted password somewhere, right? It's up to you. Um, then your password won't be in code anywhere. 